Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So after class, you can pick up your last homework assignment. And um, each problem is worth 10 points, so maximum 40 points. And what I do if you do a, put a reasonable effort into uh, solving the problem, then you get the 10 points, even if you get the wrong answer. Uh, the uh, solutions are up on the website. Um, so last class, well, we've been talking about aberrations. And the last part of the chapter on uh, aberrations is on conics. Now, later in the course, uh, we're going to talk a fair amount about the testing of aspherics, of which t uh, conics will be part of that. And so we'll see some of this material again later in the course. But it, I want to at least go over some of the, some of the basic uh, equations here. So um, and a, a good reference on the conics, I think, I think there's uh, Malacara is a good one, and also Smith's book here. So if we have a conic here, and if we let uh, s squared be x squared plus y squared, the uh, coordinates in the, in the pupil, we can write that s squared minus 2rz, where r is the radius of curvature at the vertex of the surface, plus k plus 1 times z squared is equal to, to 0. Uh, k is our conic constant. We'll look at some numbers and what names we give to the conics with the various numbers in just a minute. And uh, z will be the uh, axis of revolution. So z will be the sag. And so if we're testing a spheres, or conics, I should say, what we're going to do is we're going to measure z as a function of x and y and compare it with um, um, what it's supposed to be. If we have the case that k is equal to minus 1, and I'll just zip down here for a second and look at this curve. These are some of the surfaces for different k's. So for k equal minus 1, we call the parabola. So if, if uh, k is minus 1, this equation becomes pretty easy to solve for z. And uh, z is equal to s squared, x squared plus y squared, over 2r. So that would be the sag for the, for the parabola. If um, k is not equal to minus 1, then we can still go through here and solve for z. And just using a normal solution to the quadratic equation, we would get that z is r minus square root of, well, r squared minus k plus 1 times s squared divided by k plus 1. And the form that we more normally see that in is that um, we normally factor out an r, and then we multiply by 1 plus the square root over 1 plus the square root. And when we do that, we quite easily uh, end up with this expression right here for z, this egg. Then uh, often we will expand this in a binomial expansion. And so we'll get z is equal to s squared over 2r plus all these other terms and powers of uh, s to the fourth, s to the sixth, and so on in terms of the r's and the k's. So if I come down here and look at the curves drawn here for the types of conics, if we have a sphere, then k is going to be equal to 0. So this would be the, the spherical surface. And uh, as I said, with a k of minus 1, that's our paraboloid. And then we have ellipsoids, and we have hyperboloids. One thing it's kind of that we'll use again in the course, kind of good to know, is that if we say this is a sphere and this is paraboloid, and we do deal a lot with uh, parabolas, we see that the parabola is a little flatter than the sphere. And we'll see that, uh, well, when we get to testing a spheres, that will come up again. There are some nice properties of the conics. Again, we'll make a lot of use of this when we uh, uh, talk about the testing of, 
of uh, A-series or conics later in the course. And if I start down here with a, a paraboloid, there are, for each of these conics, there's going to be two foci. And so if I put a point source uh, at one foci, uh, the conic will image that at the other foci. And for the paraboloid, it will end up that if we put this at D5, and D5 came from the expression up above, it's just the vertex radius of curvature over 2. We'll call that the, the focal point here. We put a point source at uh, this location for a parabola, then we'll have a perfect plane wave after reflection off the parabola. And we'll certainly make very good use of that in the testing of parabolas later in the course. If I go to um, a, uh, a prolate ellipsoid, if I put a point source at one foci here, and that's the D3, D3 and D4 are given by this expression up here. Then after reflection off of this ellipsoid, the light will appear to be, well, won't appear to be, it will be coming to a, a perfect point focus at this location here, D4. And so this will end up, as we'll see when we test the ellipsoids, this will be a good way of, of testing the uh, ellipsoid here, um, prolate ellipsoid anyway. And then for hyperboloids, uh, similar deals. If you, if you put a point source at one foci after reflection off of the uh, hyperboloid, say it's a convex one, the light will appear to be coming from a point back here. Or if we reflect off of the concave one, um, um, here, reflect off that, again, it will appear to be coming from this point back here. Okay. So um, these expressions here for the foci, again, when we get to testing of, of A spheres, they will become very important, and, and you will see them again. Well, as I said, we could take z and we could do a binomial expansion um, to get z as a function of s. And I just wrote this expression here. We often are finding the difference between a conic and a sphere. And so I just put in here z for the conic, conic constant k, minus z for the sphere. Well, conic constant for a sphere was 0. So. And when you take the difference, then you're going to get some, some quantity like this. Again, we'll see more of this later. The longitudinal aberration of the, of the normal to the surface. So if we take a, a conic here and uh, take a normal to the surface, and let's say that Oops. Let's say that this is the uh, center of curvature for the vertex here. The normal will come back here at some, some location there, delta z away. And there's an expression here that delta z, an exact expression, is equal to minus a conic constant times z. So if I go to the parabola and uh, I have to say of conics, parabola is my favorite. So if I go to parabola, what k was minus 1. And so delta z is equal to z. So for a parabola, it turns out this distance right here is exactly equal to this distance back here. For surfaces other, for conics other than parabolas, it's not equal, but it's equal to minus k times z. Now I mentioned this equation here. Um, not because I've ever used it. Tell you the truth, I've never used that equation in my life. But Roland Schack, probably none of you ever met Roland Schack. Is that right? He retired before you came in. Anyway, Roland was so smart. He is, uh, in fact, he was so smart that when I, when I was uh, retiring as dean, I said, what, what office do I want to pick to, to retire in? And... Um, 
I thought, ah, I'm going to pick the office that Roland Schack used to sit in, because thinking maybe some of his brain cells would still be there. Uh, I haven't found him yet, but I, I keep looking for him. Anyway, Roland was so Schack, or so <laughs> Roland Schack was so smart that anything he tells me, I, I listen to him. And he used to tell me this equation here is, is so neat because it's exact. It's an exact, a simple equation, and it's exact. So I'll point it out to you, even though I've never found a use for it in my life, but maybe you will. So anyway. Well, you know, if we use a, a conic at these proper conjugates, the, the quantities that we had up, up here, then we're not going to have any, any spherical aberration. But if we use it at other conjugates, besides these uh, proper conjugates, we will have spherical aberration. And uh, I don't know, I, I wrote down here at one time in my life, I thought it was ex useful to see the, the spherical aberration for using a sphere at infinite conjugates. And so that's uh, an expression for that. And I go through here and uh, uh, I derive an expression here for how to, how to find the, the spherical uh, for other conics. I'm not so sure it's so important anymore. Everyone having a, a computer and you can just, you can go to the basic equations up above and just plug that in and calculate it. But at the time I originally wrote these notes, I thought that was uh, an important thing. And if you uh, aren't careful, you also will get coma, if you go off axis, remember you always see coma goes linear with a uh, field angle. And so this is just the uh, uh, expression for the coma. And astigmatism, you could, uh, this would be the expression for the astigmatism here. And remember astigmatism always goes as uh, the field angle squared. And then, so this, this, as we said, is the sag for a conic. And when we get to testing of A spheres, we'll, we'll test things besides conics. And so you'll have higher order terms here. And so I just wrote this as a more general expression for a conic. Uh, at least this is one that's rotationally symmetric. And um, um, I guess the other point here I should make here that if this, if as long as this is present, if it's not zero, um, that should be a, a four there. It seems to have disappeared here. But uh, this, this first uh, term is really redundant because we could have changed uh, the conic constant here to take care of that A4 term. Oh, you get, uh, you know, once we get to talking about conics, you get all kinds of weird shapes. And this is one they call a potato chip, because if you plot it out, it's going to look like a potato chip. Um, what else do I, oh, I mentioned axicon surfaces here. Uh, one point in my life, I got very much involved working with axicon surfaces and um, cones here. Uh, except they may not be linear, They're, they have some, some shape to them. And um, I'm just showing that an approximation that you often use to, when you're working with axicon is to use a, a hyperbolic approximation to the, to the surface. Well, I think that's everything I was going to say about conics right today when we get to our chapter on a spheres will we'll say a lot more about them, and uh, they'll be a lot of fun to, to work with. Um, a list of references here. I mean, we've mentioned Welford's two books many times. Uh, another, I think, excellent article, uh, chapter by Bill Weatherall here in um, volume eight of Applied Optics and Optical Engineering. And 
Warren Smith's book is good, and of course Malakara's book. Well, I would go with the, the latest edition now instead of the 78 edition. And then Born and Wolf. How can you live without Born and Wolf? How many copies of Born and Wolf do you have? Oh, at least one, I hope. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I just had to write a quote for they're they're honoring Emma Wolf at the OSA meeting in Rochester. And they asked me to write a quote, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something to the effect that when I was a, an undergraduate student, I first saw a copy of Principles of Optics with Born and Wolf. And I looked at that book and I said, you know, if this is optics, I want nothing to do with optics. <laughs> but then over time, <laughs> I began to appreciate the book. And now I have four copies of the book, three of which are almost completely worn out. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great book, but it was, I, it was a shock for me the first time I saw it. Maybe the same for you, I don't know. What's that? What, what you off? Oh, it was terrible, yeah. <laughs> Where I barely knew that 1 over P plus 1 over Q is 1 over F. To go from that to Born and Wolf was just a big step. And it was so thick. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, that's a great book. Okay, so um, we're finally, finally going to go on here to what I'll call real optical testing. Um, we'll go on to, uh, you know, we've talked about measurement of, of uh, paraxial properties and a little bit on measurement of materials and on aberrations. And now we're going to go on and talk about uh, optical testing. And we'll start out here with basic interferometry. Um, uh, certainly some of this, you, or most of it, maybe you've had in 505, but we'll be introducing some new stuff as we go along, I'm sure. So the um, sections in this chapter, we we'll start off with basic two-beam interference and talk about Fizeau interferometers and Twyman Green interferometers. And then we'll come back to the uh, Fizeau again. But at this point, we're going to, we're going to put in a, a um, laser source. I'm trying to adjust something here on my screen, if I can grab it. No, it's not working. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Mach Zender interferometer, typical interferograms. Um, I love moiré patterns, and I love to think about interferograms in terms of moiré patterns, so we'll spend some time doing that. Then we'll talk a little bit about classical techniques for getting data into the computer, and then that will lead us up to Chapter 5, where we'll talk about... Uh, um, digital techniques, or phase shifting interferometry. Um, so, I mean, two beam interference, this equation, how many of you had a dream about this equation last night? None of you. I don't know. By the end of the semester you will. Uh, so anyway, if we interfere two beams of light, and if they are coherent with respect to each other, we can write that um, the final irradiance is the, irrad the sum of the irradiance of the two beams, plus we have the, the interesting term here, uh, the interference term, which, uh, assuming co complete coherence, goes as 2 square root of I1, I2 cosine of the phase difference between the two beams. And I'll write that phase difference as alpha 1 minus alpha 2. And I'm going to write that, at least in this expression, I'll write it as 2 pi over the wavelength times the optical path difference. Now, there may be other reasons for a phase difference between the two beams, like a, a phase change on reflection, for example. Um, off of a dielectric, let me get a 180 degree phase change on reflection. Off of a metallic surface, it could be whatever. Um, and so um, sometimes we'll, we'll take that into account, and sometimes we'll just kind of forget about it, as I do in this uh, expression right here. So the, in optical testing, the rest of this course, what we're really going to be doing is finding this optical path difference. And uh, yes? Um, how about the, uh, 
polarization term in the uh, last term? I'm, a, I'm assuming here that the two beams have the same polarization. And we will worry about that before too long because that becomes an important factor. But I'm making the assumption here the two beams are coherent, so I don't have any uh, coherence function in here. And I'm assuming that the two beams have the same polarization. So if we were to plot this, we would just get a, a sinusoidal pattern like this. And um, it wouldn't necessarily go to zero. It would go to zero only if uh, what I1 were equal to I2. But we'll have some maximas and we'll have some minimas. And uh, we can determine this alpha 1 minus alpha 2 by looking at the positions of the maximas and the minimas. And that's what we'll do in this chapter. Next chapter, we'll some way um, electronically measure alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So how many interferometers are there in the world? A lot. I don't know what the number is, but it's a lot. But one that we talk about all the time is the Fizeau interferometer, and I like to call that the pioneer Fizeau interferometer. This was actually invented back in something like uh, 1862. What's that, 100 and 150 years ago now? And if you go to an optic shop you today, you'll still see this in the optic shop. So 150 years later, it's still it's still being used. I, it's uh, amazing. The source here, well, the source can be, uh, well, it could be a laser. Of course, 1862, it wasn't a laser. But, but more likely, in this configuration like this, it's not going to be a laser. It's going to be a, a helium source or maybe a, um, a mercury source. It's going to be extended. It's going to be uh, large here. The light comes down to a beam splitter. Some of the light will go through the beam splitter down here to the two surfaces that we're going to compare to one another. And um, in this case, in the drawing, we put the piece we're testing on top and the reference on the bottom. And, but it could be flipped around the other way. It doesn't matter. And so we're going to get reflections off of the bottom surface of the top piece, oops, and the top surface of the bottom piece. And these two beams will be reflected up here and to our eye or a camera. And we'll get interference fringes that might look like what we have at the bottom here. So these fringes are going to tell us the difference between these two surfaces. It's not an absolute measurement. Later in the course, we'll talk about absolute measurements. But right now, this is not an absolute measurement. It's a relative measurement. We're re measuring the test relative to the, to the flat surface here. Now, typically, we put these two surfaces, at least in this configuration, we're going to put the two surfaces very close together. And the reason for that is that the source here typically does not have a long coherence length. And so only paths that are closely matched in length, um, well, only beams who travel about the same distance will interfere. And so the, the surfaces here will have to be put uh, very closely together, right here anyway. Now, this short coherence length helps us in some ways. And in particular, I mean, I talked about the light reflected off the bottom surface of the top piece interfering with the light reflected off the top surface of the bottom piece. But we also have other surfaces here. And so we really have light reflected from the top surface here and the bottom surface there. But if I have a short enough coherence length source here, these other reflections will not be coherent. And so we will not see interference. The only interference will be between the two surfaces, um, the light reflected from the two surfaces that are closely together. 
Also, with the surfaces being close together, um, the, um, the fact that light will be coming down here at different angles, and so you'll have different thicknesses, uh, uh, different lengths, distances that the light travel between the two surfaces, that will not bother you so much because the surfaces are very close together. Plus, up here, the eye is probably going to be a, a small aperture, or eye or camera be a small aperture. And so um, we're capturing only a small fraction of the light that, that is illuminating this sample and a small fraction of the angles of the light that's illuminating the sample. So anyway, we get these interference fringes. And if the two surfaces are the same, if they match, then the fringes will be straight and they'll be equally spaced. And the number of fringes will simply depend upon the, the wedge angle between the two surfaces. So how many of you have used the Fuzzo in, in lab? Most of you. OK, good. And so you just kind of put the two surfaces together, and you see fringes pretty much right away. And if you want to adjust the number of fringes, what you kind of push and move things around a little bit, and you can, you can tweak the number of fringes. And um, right now, we're, we're looking at how straight the fringes are. So you need to have a few fringes. But if you get too many fringes, then the fringes are so close together, and it's hard to tell uh, how much they depart from being perfectly uh, straight. And so I don't know what number of fringes, you know, 8, 10, 12, some number like that is kind of a, a typical number in a fuzzo. And again, when we get to phase shifting, we'll, we'll probably fluff out the fringes. But right now, we want to have a, a few fringes um, present here. Okay. So along, you know, along a fringe, the OPD is a constant. And going from one fringe to the next fringe, the OPD changes by 1. Okay. And so if the OPD changes by 1, how much does the thickness between the plates change by? Half a wave. Okay, let's go through here twice. So, if the uh, one fringe to the next the OPD changes by one wavelength, the height separation between the two surfaces changes by half a wavelength at normal incidence. Okay, and the nice thing about using the beam splitter here is that we do look in here pretty much at normal incidence. So if the surfaces do not match, then we're going to get fringes that are not going to be straight. And so what I did with this drawing here, I simply drew the two best straight lines I could through the two fringes. And I said, well, let's see here. The average spacing here is some number s. And um, this fringe departs from the right location by some amount delta, where delta is a function of position here, so I write it delta as a function of x and y. And I know that in going from one fringe to the next, the OPD changes by one wave. I know that the separation between the two surfaces changes by a half wave. So if I see, you know, the fringes aren't straight, we're off by some amount here delta then it sort of makes sense that the surface height error is off by some amount. Well, from here to here, the distance between the surfaces changes by, by lambda over 2. And so this must correspond to a surface height error of delta over s times lambda over 2. Okay. So if I look here and just can you give me, if I look at this particular location here, I say, well, delta over S is, give me a number. What is it? It's how much? I'll drink some coffee while you. I'll believe anything you tell me, okay? How much? Five, okay. So delta over S is one over five. So the surface height error is a tenth of a fringe. And a fringe, visible light, 
a, the wavelength, well, it's a tenth of a wave. I shouldn't say a tenth of a fringe. I misspoke there. It's a tenth of a wave. And so the wavelength is, for visible light, is half a micron, some number like that, 500 nanometers. And so a tenth of that would be 50 nanometers. So this corresponds to a height error of about 50 nanometers on the surface. So we see it eh, pretty, pretty accurate. In fact, when we get to the next chapter, we're going to talk about measuring height errors down the angstrom range. I mean, it's, uh, interferometry is very, very accurate. So this is, we said, a tenth of a wave. And uh, I misspoke. I said it was a tenth of a fringe, but it's not. It's a fifth of a fringe or a tenth of a wave. Okay. So anyway, that's an expression that you'll see and use a lot. Now let's say I, um, oh, it's all messed up on my computer here, but it seems to be okay. Oh, now it's okay. Um, let's say that we're looking at a surface here that is basically flat, except it has a little region here that's low. I call it a valley. It's a low spot. And for this illustration, I put the reference on top and a test on the bottom, but it, it could have been the other way around. It doesn't matter. So, and I'm going to put a little wedge, a little tilt between the two surfaces here. And so, where the two surfaces are flat here, I'm going to get nice, straight, equally spaced fringes. But now when I get over here where I have this low spot, what's going to happen to the fringes? Are they going to move towards the left, or are they going to move towards the right? Well, the thing to remember is that for a given fringe, the separation between the two surfaces is a constant. So some way, this fringe is going to have to move left or right in order to make the separation between the two fringes. Uh, the, the, along that fringe, the separation between the two surfaces has to be a constant. So I'm going to make an assumption here now. I, I'm going to assume that I put in enough wedge here between the two surfaces such that this wedge angle is larger than any of the slope errors uh, on the surface. In a minute, we'll come back and say, what if we don't do that? But let's say right now we're making this wedge angle larger than any of the slope errors on, on the surface. So that means as I go from left to right across here, the separation is always increasing regardless whether I have a, uh, a low spot here or if I have a bump on it. I have enough wedge here that when I move from left to right, the, the separation between the two surfaces is always increasing. So that's all I need to know. Now if I think, as I, as I come along this fringe, well, that's two surfaces are flat up here, so this fringe will be straight. Now when I get to this low spot, this fringe is going to have to move such that along that fringe, the separation between the two surfaces is a constant. So that fringe is going to have to move towards the thin portion of the wedge. While if I had a bump, the fringe would have to move towards the thick portion of the wedge in order to satisfy what's in the box here. Okay. So by looking at the fringes here, and if I know the direction of the wedge anyway, looking at the fringes, I can determine whether I have a low spot or if I have a high spot on the surface. And I can determine how much error it is by just this lambda over 2 times delta over s factor. So the next question might be, how do I know the direction of the wedge? How do I know which side here is open and which side is closed? 
Ah, very good. The way that I would do it, and the way you're saying it, we're going to push down on this. And if we push down on the open side of the wedge, we're going to tend to close the wedge, and we're going to get fewer fringes, because we're making the two surfaces more nearly parallel. While, if I push down on the closed side, and I, you know, I, maybe my drawing's not real good. I show these touching, but they're probably not touching. There's always some dust, dirt, something in between. Um, if, I, if I push down on the closed side of the wedge, I will increase the angle between the two surfaces, and I'll get more fringes. You don't press much. You just barely touch it. You'll, you'll see it. Those of you who have used a fizzo in the lab have, have seen that. And so I can determine what side is open, what side is closed, and um, then I can determine whether this corresponds to a low spot or a high spot. Question? When you press on one side and then the fringes twist rather than uh, space out or uh, Well, now, if, uh, if I were to press down not on this side or this side, if I were to press up here, then the fringes would rotate a little bit because I'm, I'm introducing tilt in the other direction. So I want to push down for this. I want to, you know, I, if fringes are like this, I want to push down either on this side or this side and not someplace up here. Now you also, if you push too hard, you might distort the surface too. That, you don't really want to do that. You just barely want to touch it. Mm -hmm. Answer your question? Yeah. So I, I put some wedge in here. Well, I did it for two reasons. One is when you put the two surfaces together, you almost always get wedge. <laughs> uh, whether you want it or not, you get it. But I, I really wanted wedge here because right now, the only way we're determining whether the surface is the right shape or not is by looking at how straight the fringes are. And so if I didn't have a few tilt fringes, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell how, how straight they were. I don't want to put too many in, as I said before, because then it's hard to see just little wiggles in the, in the, in the fringes. Now, let's say for a second, let's say I do put these together. So the two surfaces here, where well, they're flat, they're really parallel to one another. So now what would I see down here? What? You would see basically one fringe, but in the, the region where this is low, right now what I would see would be a little change in intensity. If this were low enough, you know, so I had more than one fringe of error, then I would see some closed fringes here, if this were deep enough. But for right now, this is only a fraction of, of a fringe of error, all I'm going to see is a little intensity change. So if I'm looking at fringes, you know, trying to determine what the surface is just by looking at fringes, I really need to put in the tilt. Later when we get to phase shifting, we won't, we won't need the tilt at all. But for right now, I need, to put, I need to put in some tilt fringes. So this is, I mean, this is very, very basic. We're going to talk about a million different interferometers this semester. Well, maybe not quite a million, close to it. Um, but, you know, this is two-beam interference. If you understand this, you're going to understand all the other ones. Any questions? No? Okay. Well, in uh, optics, one of the first things you, you read about when you read about interference would be Newton's rings. And so Newton's rings, what we're doing is we're putting together a flat, and we're putting, and the other surface is a curved surface, a spherical surface. And for my drawing, I make it a convex surface, but it could be concave. So I look at this, and I get fringes here. Ooh, did, did we mess up on this drawing? Should that be a bright fringe in the center instead of a dark fringe? Ah, very good. 
So one, one reflection here will be from a high index, say, you know, say we have air in here, and this is glass, so one and a half or so. So high index to low index. The other reflection down here would be a low index to a high index. And so the two reflected beams have a 180 degree phase change on reflection difference between them. And so even though the path lengths are the same here right at the center, the 180 degree phase change gives us a dark fringe at the center. Or if I were to really be good and make optical contact here, I mean the light's just going straight through and it still would be dark in, in the center here. So in the center here, the, the, um, the fringe is going to be dark. Now, if I, if I look here, let's see, this has a radius of curvature r. I want to kind of calculate where the fringes are here as a function of r. And so this is r. And uh, the separation here, I, I'll just call that z. And so I have a little right triangle here that I can write that r squared is equal to r minus z squared plus let this radius out here be r sub m. And so this is our expression here. r squared is r minus z quantity squared plus r sub m squared. And um, well, just like we did in class a couple classes ago, we can expand that. <coughs> we will assume that z squared is small and we can throw it away. And so we end up that z is r sub, n, r sub m squared over 2r. So again, we're making this parabolic approximation to the spherical surface. Now, I want to know um, where the fringes are out here. And I'll say, well, the bright fringe of, I'll start here, say order 0 is out here. So I can write that z here is equal to m plus a half times lambda over 2. And we have to put in that half because of the phase change on reflection. And so uh, I can solve here for, well, r in terms of r sub m squared if I want to. And so uh, r here would simply be r sub m squared over lambda m plus a half. And so this gives us the relationship between the radius out here for fringe order m and the radius of curvature of the surface here. Okay. Yes? If we have white light, um, that means uh, zero OPD is you know, at the center and uh, high contrast will be at the center. Mm -hmm. If you have spherical but uh, concave, then zero OPD will be like at the edges uh, or somewhere there. Right, Do right. you call that still Newton rings? Oh, I would still call it Newton's rings, yeah, whether it's concave or convex. But you're right. If I were to right here, the if I were to use white light here, the paths are matched at the center. And so at the center here, I'll get good contrast fringes. And as I move out from the center, the different wavelengths, uh, well, the fringes for the different wavelengths will separate. And the fringe contrast will drop off. If I had used a, a uh, instead of a convex surface, if I had a concave surface, then in the center, the two surfaces are not um, um, not touching, and so the OPD is not zero in the, in the center, and so you would not have good contrast in the center. You get the good contrast out here, where the where the two uh, surfaces touch one another. I think generally for the illustration of Newton's rings, normally they use um, uh, a convex surface like this. But you'll get the, the same, for monochromatic light, you'll get the same basic fringes uh, with a concave, just that the order number, instead of increasing as you go out, would, would uh, 
decrease as you go out. Yeah, M is the index of the fringes, and I arbitrarily made M equal to zero here. I mean, I could have made M equal to one there if you want to. Then I'd have to uh, make a minus sign down here instead of a plus sign. But I just... Oh, it may be off. I don't know. One, two, yeah. I guess we can't count. You're right. One... Zero, one, yeah, well. I'm going to go back to Eric Goodwin. He, uh, he drew that picture. I'll give him the blame. But you're right. But I, we just put that there just to make sure you're, you're checking it closely. So. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on this? So that's if we don't introduce any tilt. Now, if I come over here and I introduce a little tilt, and I can do this with either a concave surface or a convex surface, introduce a little tilt. So now the fringes, instead of being circular, as we have here, we're going to get curved fringes like this. If I have a, a concave surface here, so concave like so, and I put, the, I put the reference on top here and the test surface on the bottom here, if I have a concave surface here, then the surface is higher at the edge, and so the fringes are going to curve towards the thick portion of the wedge. If I have a convex surface here, now the fringes are lower at the edge, and so the, I mean, the surface is lower at the edge, so the fringes are going to move towards the, curve towards the thin portion of the wedge. So you can tell by knowing the direction of the wedge, you can just tell whether it's concave or it's convex. Okay. Any questions on that? Well, this Fuseau, as I said, is Fuseau interferometer, interferometer was invented something like 150 years ago and is still used. But there really are uh, and it's used because it's simple and it's fairly inexpensive. But there are probably two problems with it that, that we, um, we have to worry about. And the first problem is, I mean, we're, we're comparing one surface with another one. And this test is very sensitive. You know, we're talking about nanometers, of measuring nanometers of height. So if the two surfaces depart very much, you're going to get so many fringes, you're just not going to be able to see them. And so, if I'm testing only flat surfaces, okay, so what? You know, I, I, I buy one master flat, and that's all I need. But if I'm testing curved surfaces, then I'm going to have to have a reference, generally called a test plate, I'm going to have to have a reference for every radius of curvature I want to measure. And so, if, if you visit an optics house that makes a lot of spherical optics, you'll find they have a room filled with all these test plates of all the different radius of curvatures. And so for every concave surface you make, you need a convex reference, convex test plate. So while the Fuseau is fairly inexpensive, if you're going to test a lot of different radius of curvatures over a period of time, you're going to end up spending, investing a lot of money in test plates. So that's one drawback to the Fuseau, as I've described it so far anyway. The other drawback, and this certainly doesn't pertain to anyone in this room, but I'll mention it. I mean, you're putting these two surfaces right next to each other, and you're moving them around, and it's very easy to scratch the surfaces. And no one here would ever do that, I know. But I know when I've taught the lab, I don't know if it's a ghost during the night or whatever it was, but somehow the surfaces always got scratched. Um, so that's another drawback to using a... Uh, this classical Fuseau is that you, you end up scratching the surfaces. So you can if you're not careful. So there's a need for other types of interferometers, which is good. Otherwise, the course might be over right now. Um, but the next interferometer I want to talk about is what we'll call the, the Twyman-Green interferometer. 
And I love the Twyman Green, I have to say. I'm trying to adjust something here. There, I got it. The Twyman Green, well, I'm going to say it's my favorite denophorometer. The only problem is we're recording this class, and you'll have a record of my saying that. And so next week when I talk about another interferometer, I tell you that's my favorite interferometer. You'll begin, you won't believe me. But right today, anyway, the Twyman Green is my favorite interferometer. Invented back something like 1918 by, who do you think invented it? Well, I don't know who invented it, but the people who got the patent on it were Mr. Twyman and Mr. Green. In the, in the UK. And I guess in 1918 they didn't have a laser here, but today you, you generally will use a laser uh, with a Twyman Green. So, oops, so I'll show it with a laser. So let's look at this here. So now what we're going to do is, this is the surface we're going to test. And I'm first going to talk about flat surfaces, and then we'll talk about curved surfaces. And uh, In some ways, curved surfaces are more exciting than flat surfaces, but we want to start here with the, the simple things. So I'll put a flat here, and I'm going to have to have a reference. My reference will be up here. So I no longer put them next to each other, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to scratch the surface now. I shouldn't anyway. So anyway, I take my laser source here, and I put in some optics, and I expand the beam up. Collimated beam. Normally I use a collimated beam here. At least as large as a mirror I want to test. So light goes out here. Back here, I put in a beam splitter. You know, some of the light goes reflects off a beam splitter up the reference mirror. And when it comes back, it will come out here. And the test beam will reflect off here and come out here. And down here, I'm going to get the interference fringes. And these fringes are going to look just like what I had with the Fuzzo. And I have the same equation, lambda over 2 times delta over s, um, will tell me uh, how this surface uh, departs from the reference, which is a flat surface here. So this is pretty pretty nice for testing flats. But let's think about it for a second. Let's see. So what optics here have to be good? You know, maybe I should, before I get to that, I'll, I'll talk about this lens here for a second and say what I'm doing here. One thing I'm doing with that lens is that this is bringing the light to focus here. And so this beam will come back here and produce a, a bright spot there. And the reference beam will be focused here, produce a bright spot. And generally in the alignment then, we'll look at these two spots and we'll tip and tilt this mirror to bring the two spots together. And then I'll see fringes here. And uh, so that's my course alignment. And then I'll tweak this a little bit, tipping and tilting it to get the number of fringes I want. Okay, well, what optics have to be good? Well, certainly the reference mirror has to be good. Does the beam splitter have to be good? Yeah, beam splitter has to be good. We get one beam reflected and then transmitted. The other one is transmitted and reflected, but it's going in the opposite direction. And so errors in the beam splitter do not cancel out. And in fact, we have more problems with the beam splitter that I'll talk about in a minute. We have um, a laser here, and probably the beam coming out of the laser is pretty small. So I'm going to have to put in some optics to expand the size of the beam, bring it to focus maybe, and then uh, put in a collimator lens to collimate it. So the question is, how good do these optics have to be? Does this have to be a really high-quality collimated beam? You say no. Why is the answer no? That's the right answer, I agree. Because uh, you cancel out. Very good. We're finding, we're finding the difference between these two beams. And so whatever errors we have in this beam will be in both these beams, and it will cancel out. Almost exactly. Now, the, you don't want garbage here in this. You, know, you don't want it to be a terrible beam because... First off, I'm, I'm going to have, at least at the present time, I'm going to have a little tilt between the two beams. So there's a little, maybe a little shear here. And, you know, if these paths are not exactly the same length, then there's going to be a, 
the errors will not exactly cancel, but it'll come very close. So, you, you know, you don't want this to depart from a collimated beam by 100 waves of OPD. But, you know, one wave, two waves of OPD, that's fine. Okay. So this collimator here doesn't have to be super high quality. I put in this crazy lens here for some reason, besides bringing it to, um, to focus here, but I'll come back to that second why I'm using it. But does that lens have to be high quality? No. no. And the same reason. Because both beams are going through it, and whatever aberrations introduced but that lens will introduce into both beams. Almost, I mean, we have a little wedge, we have a little tilt between the two interfering beams, so it doesn't 100% cancel out. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be very good in general. Yes? Is it important not to have distortion? Well, yeah, that gets into, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you don't. You want to, if I measure something down here, measuring in my interferogram, I want to know what point back here that corresponds to. So you're right. You don't want this to be distorting that, that surface down here. Why do I even put a lens in here? I mean, I, I, mean, I have, uh, you know, this is coming from a point source, and the fringes I learned in 505, but the fringes for... Um, if I have a point source, the fringes are non-localized. The fringes are going to exist every place here. Why do I even put in a lens there? In fact, you, you find interferometers where they don't put in a lens here. And I would never buy one of those interferometers. People do, and they're a bad mistake. You have to have this lens. But why? why? I mean, I use a lens in the alignment mode, but why else do I want a lens? Well, what? Yeah, I want, I want to image. I mean, I want to know what the surface of this mirror is. And so, you know, I'm not looking at, you know, well, I reflect a beam off this mirror and, and the beam propagates along and I want to know what the shape of the beam is some distance away. What I want to know is this mirror right here. What's the surface of this mirror? And so I want to put in an imaging lens here that will image this mirror down here. And if I don't do that, I can think of at least two examples of where I, I run into trouble. First off, you know, this beam, it should overfill this mirror here. And if I look down here, if I don't put in an imaging lens, I mean, I'm going to get some Fresnel diffraction due to the edges here. And the shape of that wavefront will change. And so I will probably, if I don't put in an imaging lens, when I look down here at the edge of the mirror, I'm going to, the fringes are going to be curved a little bit. And I might think, oh, well, the mirror has a down edge. Well, it's not that it has a down edge. It's that I'm getting some Fresnel diffraction from that. And so I get rid of that problem by putting in an imaging lens here that will image the surface down here to where I'm looking at the interferogram. So because of diffraction, I want to put the mirror in, uh, the lens in. The other reason, let's say I have some steep zones in this mirror. So that I have some, you know, errors that are pretty steep slopes. So light comes along here, and just thinking geometrically, it hits these steep slopes, and it doesn't come right back on itself. It's going to come back at some angle. And so if I don't have this lens here, the light that, you know, from there that should be here, you know, is actually someplace else. And so I'm going to see regions where I don't have any light because of steep zones. And I'm going to see regions where I have too much light because, you know, light has distributed itself over the surface. And so you really want to put an imaging lens here. And I, I get so upset that some, some uh, interferometer companies, to save money, to make the system simpler, to make it smaller, they say, well, we just won't put in that lens there. You know, and maybe 90% of the time, you, you're okay. But the other 10% of the time, you're, you're getting measurement errors by not imaging the surface onto the interferometer. So never buy or build an interferometer 
that doesn't have this imaging lens. It doesn't have to be a very high quality imaging lens, but you want to have it. Okay. Yes? So if you put a lens in and the OPD between the two mirror is so large, this may be a problem, right? Because you have two different... Um, well, I'm going to... Yeah. Okay, first off, um, this, mi this mirror is going to be a high-quality mirror. I'm not going to have steep zones in it. Furthermore, I, maybe my drawing doesn't show it, but this mirror should be larger than this mirror here. And um, so, you know, if this is the wrong distance away, that I can't image both of these. I want to image this one. And this one, the Fresnel diffraction, will be outside of the interferogram that I'm looking at. And so you don't have to image both of these. It's the one you're testing that you want to image. And we'll see that very clearly in a, in a little bit when we get to testing the circle surfaces that we, we're probably not going to be able to image both of these. So you want to be able to image the mirror under test. You want this to be the limiting aperture in the system and not this or not the size of the beam here. Any other question? Well, right now, I'm making these two paths equal in my drawing, so the coherence of the source is not too important. Later, when we talk about testing spheres, then we're going to come back and worry about source coherence. Uh, I want to make a comment or two about this beam splitter. I've had so much trouble in my life with beam splitters. I mean, we said, well, the surface has to be good. But there's another problem here that is um, ah, driven me crazy many times. And that is that this beam splitter, I mean, it has two surfaces. And so I'm getting reflection off of both surfaces. A laser source is generally has good coherence, and so both of these reflections are coherent with respect to each other, as well as coherent with the, the beams we're trying to measure. And so I can easily get spurious interference fringes from that, or additional interference fringes that I don't want from that reflection off of the beam splitter I don't want. So there are, well, I can think of four ways to get around that problem, and maybe more, but I think of four right now. Can you give me some ways to get around the problem with that reflection off the other surface? So. What's that? Polarizing beam splitter and quarter wave combinations. Um, yeah, that generally uses a, a, a cube beam splitter. And I still may get a reflection off of the, um, of the surface of the cube beam splitter. I have a drawing coming up, a slide coming up in a little bit on the polarization interferometer. So let me, let me wait till I get to that before I, I talk more about the polarization interferometers. Pellicle? Pellicle? Okay, so a pellicle is a very thin membrane. Um, that I could put in here. So I essentially have only one, well, one surface. I have two surfaces, but they're very close together. So that would get around that problem, but it creates another problem. What's the other problem it creates? Have you ever use a pellicle as a beam splitter? Yes, waving. waving it. Well, it's hard to get nice flat ones, but the other problem is if you do any talking in the room or any noise in a room, it acts like a drum, drum head. It will vibrate like crazy. So you can use, we'll, we'll have a slide coming up in a minute, uh, where we're going to use a pellicle in transmission for something, but a pellicle as a beam splitter in reflection, the fringes are going to jump around too much. So I won't buy that idea. What? I missed what, the comp compensator. Compensator. You put the compensator in the best. 
the OPD, is that what you Well, that, the compensator you do to compensate for the OPD, but the, the problem I'm worried about now is that this beam splitter has two sides, and I'm getting reflection off of both sides and getting some fringes I don't want. Coat it. Okay, put an anti-reflection coating on it. And uh, that will work. And, but I don't like it. Because I have to put on a very good, high-quality anti-reflection coating. And you know what that means? Lots of money. And my name is James C. Wyant. You know what the C stands for? Cheap. Okay. <laughs> So you're right, that will work and people do that, but uh, it's too expensive. I don't like it. So give me another way. Ah, that's the best answer right there. Put in a wedge here. So you put in a few minutes of wedge. And so I will still get a reflection off the surface that I don't want, but it's going to come off at a different angle. And so this lens here is going to focus that at a different location. And if you look at this lens, I put in a, well, not a real small, that's not a pinhole. I don't want to clean up the aberrations in the beam down here because I'm trying to measure the aberrations. But if I have a few minutes of wedge here and I put in a reasonable size pinhole here, millimeter in diameter or something, depending on the focal length of this imaging lens, that beam will come to focus off to the edge and it won't get to the interference pattern. So wedge in the beam splitter is a good solution. When you say wedge, do you mean just you have a, a perfect beam splitter or whatever and then you just tilt it a little bit? No, I mean the two surfaces, of, it's a plate beam splitter, two surfaces are not parallel to one another. There's a wedge of a few minutes of arc between them. Now, I still get that reflection, and what I do now, I will put in a cheap, put on it a cheap AR coating. It doesn't do a very good job, but it reduces the in intensity of reflected light enough that I can tell, you know, which side the reflection is from. And so I'll, I'll put in a wedge with a, a cheap, poor quality AR coating on it. So that's my best way. Another way where we mentioned a cube beam splitter, but you, you get into problems with reflections off of surfaces of that. Um, Brewster's angle is another way of doing this. Um, if I have a surface that is uncoated, so it's just a dielectric sur surface, and I illuminate it at the right angle with the right polarization, I will not get a reflection. Brewster's angle, you've seen that. And so, um, sometimes people will do that, the, the side of the beam splitter they want coated, uh, that they want to use, they'll have coated. The other side will be uncoated. They'll put in the, um, so if I'm reflecting off of the uh, beam splitter, say that, um, say the desk here is the surface of the beam splitter, what I don't want, so if the light's coming in like this, I don't want the, uh, S component of polarization. I want the P component. S will be reflected. P will not be at Brewster's angle. And so this would not be at you know, 90 degrees, but this would probably be tipped more and the reference beam would come off here at some angle and you have a reference mirror here. So some people have made these to, to work at Brewster's angle to get rid of that reflection. But the most common way nowadays is the, the wedge. Does anyone have any other ways? I've run out of ways, but those are the ways I think of. Uh, let's see, I'll put in some more comments here. Oh, okay. What, what reflectivity should this beam splitter have? What? I can't hear what you said. About 4% for the beam splitter. So we would reflect 4. I mean, if it's uncoated, it would be about 4. But I think we want something probably higher than that. Yes? It really depends uh, on your test field. If you have all the light coming back, you want to be 
Okay, so you're saying it depends upon the relative reflectives, reflectivities of these two mirrors. What you want eventually is that both beams coming back 50-50. Right, you like to have both beams coming back that have the same intensity so you get the best contrast ranges. Yeah, so you put whatever input through that you get Okay, so let's, let's think here for a second. I have the beam coming along here. It's reflected and it's transmitted. The other beam comes along, is transmitted, and then it's reflected. So does changing the reflectivity of this beam splitter change the relative intensities of the two beams? No. no. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing. It doesn't change the two. To get, and so changing reflectivity will not change the relative intensity of two beams. Does it change the amount of light that comes out here? And the, the answer of that is going to be yes. And if you go through the calculation, if you say there's no absorption, so you get, um, you know, what's not transmitted is reflected. It will turn out what you want here is a 50% reflectivity to get the maximum light out here. But the interesting thing is that it will not change the relative intensities of the two beams. And so with this drawing, if, if this is a coated mirror, I probably want this to be coated. If this isn't just a piece of glass, probably the reference should be a piece of glass. The last question I have on this before we, we break for today is, let's say I have perfect optics I'm testing here, made in our optic shop here at Optical Sciences. Okay, Perfect optics, and I adjust this, and I get one big fringe here and it's black. I get one big black fringe. Where has the light gone? What's that? Back to the laser. Yeah, very good. It has gone back to the laser. Because you have, well, I mean there's two outputs here. This way and this way. And then you know, out here, back there, and back there. And so we have these two outputs. Now, is it clear why the, what goes back here has to be out of phase with what comes here? Is that all? Because I, I can come up with a case where it ends up at both black here, and if I were to put in a beam splitter and look at what goes back, it can also be black there. But if this is a dielectric one, then, if we think here for a second, I'll draw the, the beam splitter. So I have a reflection here. Oops, we'll extend this down here, okay. So if I think here, I have a beam here that is low index to high index. This is high index to low index. If I look at what's coming back here, it's low to high, low to high, and no reflection at all here. So the, if this is dielectric, these two beams, these two interferograms, the light coming back here and the light going back there, are always 180 degrees out of phase. Okay. So you're right. So if I get a dark fringe here, all the light has gone back there. If I put a metallic coating on here, I've seen the case where I had a dark fringe here and a dark fringe going back there. Where has the light gone in that case? Well, it's being absorbed by the coating. Because with metallic coating, who knows what the phase change on reflection is? I don't know. But if I get to the case where I have a dark fringe here and a dark fringe there at the same time, then the light must be absorbed by the, the coating, the metallic coating that's put on there. Yes? 
we'll come we'll come back to that next class and yeah that's going to be an interesting an interesting thing to look at in that case that will come back next class well my time is up but I forgot to talk about football and who is it we play this weekend Oklahoma State let's see how did they do last week they won by a score of 84 to nothing. I, I don't know who they played, but I think that's a bad sign that they won. If I go back two years ago, we played them in the Alamo Bowl. I went to the Alamo Bowl. I had so much fun there except for one thing. The game. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> Last year we played them, and instead of going to the game, I decided to have open heart surgery. So I missed the game, but I think I actually was better off. Uh, <laughs> and so what's going to happen Saturday? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, we'll talk about it on Tuesday. So I'll see you bright and early Tuesday morning.